Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a privilege to come out here and uh, share some information with you. And uh, uh, did this, I think it was last year or the year before, uh, when, the uh, when the Blue Card uh, initiative was first launched. Uh, a few things have changed from a medical perspective when it comes to managing concussion. Um, but uh, I think I'll, I'll get into that a little bit, just for interest, I think, to make the evening a little more interesting. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, particular changes to the original blue card um, document and recommendations for reps. Um, we talked uh, a while ago, there was some consternation initially on how to recognise a concussion and, um, and the pressure that reps sometimes felt in making that call. Um, uh, I did uh, talk to somebody uh, recently that suggested that reps uh, were, were not issuing a lot of blue cards um, and, and nobody's offered uh, why or whether that reflects the number of concussions you know, against blue cards. But, um, but perhaps this evening we can uh, talk about it and then, um, and then see going forward whether this changes the issue of blue cards or not. Um, so, so I, I, I've got two ways of managing this. I thought perhaps I will just introduce you to this document um, for anybody who's remotely interested in the subject of concussion. Um, it's a position uh, document by the American Medical Association for Sports Medicine. Um, and, and it pretty much summarizes all you need to know about the current state of concussion management, at least in sport. Um, it's a great document. It's not written you know, for specialist doctors or anything. It's, pretty, uh, it's open to the public kind of statement. And it's available in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. It was published last year in January, 31st of January, British Journal of Sports Medicine. And what it says, uh, basically, just uh, in the way of um, looking at it now, uh, all I, all I do on a Monday is I see concussions. And I have done for some years now. And I think at last count I've written nearly 500 reports for ACC. And each report is about four, A4 four pages long. So that's a lot of pages written about patients who've suffered on concussions. So, so I've, I've got a bit of feel, but I am uh, just uh, talking tonight about mild concussions. Um, I'm not going to go into um, moderate or severe um, because they are a step up and probably on unusual events even for me uh, to see moderate. And that is really um, defined uh, by the, um, uh, the length of time of loss of consciousness and memory <coughs> impairment, really. Uh, mild would be with or without loss of consciousness and um, usually with a memory impairment that's less than 24 hours. I use the term memory <coughs> impairment because it doesn't necessarily mean memory, total memory loss uh, but this you know, vagueness and uh, forgetfulness. And um, The other thing about mild uh, concussions is they are often the symptoms will only present after 24 hours. Um, so, so they may not be immediately evident. Whereas the more moderate ones, there often is a loss of consciousness and, and the damage is much more obvious. Um, so for the sake of tonight's talk, we'll, we'll just be talking about mild concussions. The kind of concussions you see on a rugby field, really. Um, and. Um, uh, what's changed too, I, th I think it's worth highlighting, is, is really the recovery. Um, there was a four-day conference in Auckland um, in, in November, which I attended. I was disappointed to see that there were only three, three rugby docs there. Steve Cara, who is the sports medicine president and previous doc for the Aucklanders. Them, both the mighty team and the super team, and myself and one other. Um, I don't know why that was and was there. The room was filled with occupational therapists. Any reps there? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, but um, uh, we had a keynote speaker from Philadelphia, who's a very famous man in, in the world of medicine, because he works so closely with uh, the, the professional football, the Philadelphia Eagles. Eagles. Uh, and so he brought to the table an awful lot of experience in exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, in fact, I might be, just uh, by way of interest, I might be doing a study with him on, because uh, I do sleep medicine, and, and the current undertone of what goes wrong in concussion has got to do with the autonomic nervous system. And some of you may be aware that, of course, sleep is often disturbed in those who've been concussed. Um, so um, my next presentation may involve something from that study. Um, so, so to summarize, um, uh, you, get the, you get the rugby player who's had a bit of a zinger. It, it may not be immediately obvious on the field, um, or it is obvious, and either myself as a match day doctor or, or, or some, the physio will bring him off for an HIA. Okay, and there's HI1. I have an app on my phone, um, which if I wasn't so flippin' short-sighted and I only had the iPhone 7 model, okay, uh, uh, you know, it's a bit fiddly, uh, but it gets the job done. And, and uh, my phone has all the, all the team's um, pre-season scores for the HIA on them, and I can access them and all these scores, and then compare it to the score I'd when I performed the test on the sideline for which, for which the refs are very strict about timing. Thank you, refs. <laughs> and, um, and it's by no means uh, absolute. Um, you know, for, for what I see on the field, and then I do the test, I see people passing the test, uh, but I still keep them off because it's so obvious that they've been concussed. And at other times, uh, they don't pass the test, and you wonder why, because it wasn't that big a knock. So, but it's, it, so it's not the absolute truth. I need to point that out. These are tools that we use to, as quickly as we can, assess, uh, as, assess the condition of the player to either say yay or nay. Um, Is it that something you could go into a little bit sooner? Oh, it's always sure. intrigued me. Uh, exactly the same thing. You see some dudes there laughing and smiling and quite happy, but they, they have failed. Well, you know, they might have failed the damn thing before they started. You know, who knows? But a bit of information on, on perhaps what sort of stuff goes into the... Okay, that's, that's a very good. That's a, a nice way to do it because it does sort of lead the discussion in the direction that you guys would find useful. I'm just going to show you something on this uh, document that explains just how 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 difficult it is, or easy, depending on, on your perspective. So, so what you're going to see is coming up is uh, a lot of words, and then there's a picture. Can you see that picture? See the picture, we can't read the words. Yeah. Okay, well that's okay, because even I can't read it. Um, it's, it's really... It's really to point out what a difficult task that question uh, is. It, it's a difficult task. Those are the different systems that, that, that are impacted by a concussion um, and how they all interact to give you your concussion symptoms. So, so even for the so-called experts, it, it's not, not that easy. Um, uh, but it's an, it's, it's an alteration of a previous state. You know, that's why you don't need a loss of consciousness. If the player um, seems different to the way he was before he ran on the paddock, that's enough. Um, so uh, you've got pre, pre information on the players. Pre information is, is useful. That's probably very interesting. Now, yeah. yeah, yeah. now refs, uh, and uh, again at the sevens tournament, uh, again, uh, uh, Neil and I uh, were there as match doctors. Um, th that's quite interesting because, I mean, we know a little bit more about the Bay players and, uh, and we'll know some of their background, but 
when you go to a tournament like that, you don't know any of their backgrounds. And you do actually, I did on two or three occasions, rely quite heavily on what the physio or the trainer's opinion was. Um, uh, which is normal medical practice, by the way. That's not unusual. You're always looking for some information that supports your own your own ideas. So, so for us as community, community rugby referees, with really no knowledge of how the player was beforehand, that like talking to the team physio. Yeah, or yeah that's uh, talking to to anybody who knows the player, uh, family members, anything. Saying, look, I don't know this, but what do you think? Or, you know, on, on the paddock, it would be his fellow players. You know. Um, you know, the captain, you know, what do you think? It, it's fine to do that because it is a community responsibility, if you know what I mean. You, you don't want anybody holding this whole thing in their hand and saying it's all up to me because it's quite difficult to recognize. I think from a ref's point of view, I, th I think it's... Uh, so I'm surprised that there are more concussions when I see the clashes, you know. You know, I hear them, I hear them. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm and, and sometimes I'm also surprised what little it takes uh, sometimes to drop a player, you know. So you've just got to have an open mind and and be aware. And I suppose that's why you guys run these kind of events is is to share information, share experiences, and uh, and then become more experienced at recognizing concussion. Um, there's no one single <coughs> thing I could tell you um, that would say that's that's definitely a concussion. Um, I, I say that because of course the definition of a mild concussion, you may not know they were concussed for 24 hours. Because these symptoms come on gradually. Okay? Um, particularly in those who've not experienced a loss of consciousness. I, I think that everybody would agree in this room that if a player <coughs> was knocked unconscious, <laughs> you know, he needs to, he's, he's concussed, you know, I, I, you know, I've had some battles in the past with coaches and physios about that, and players, where they honestly believe that they're fine, but that's just absurd, there's been an altered state of consciousness, they use that word altered state of consciousness <coughs> in that document, um, uh, they don't say there's been a loss of consciousness, been an altered state, so it can be dazed, you know, momentarily. Um, yep. That's quite challenging because I've, I've come across quite a number of players over the years who experience an altered state of consciousness when they cross the line onto the field. <laughs> <laughs> Before the game, they seem such gentlemen. Hard to a Parkinson. I was going to name names. No, I, I, I think I'm, I'm very empathetic. To, um, to this idea of how difficult the task is. I, I'll share an anecdote. Um, I, uh, increasingly, it's quite expensive to travel with docks, it seems, because more and more docks are pitching up in the bay, and more and more teams are pitching up in the bay, particularly in the minor 10 competition, without a dock with them. And, and so I get the call, and I'm asked to, to be the dock for the day. Um, which is great fun, I have to say. It, it's great fun to get into the team. So I just have to share with you anecdotally my impressions of that, just for a moment. Okay. So, so Canterbury has asked me a few occasions. Um, so first of all, the teams in the South Island, they pay. They actually email me and offer me a fee. It's up to me to accept it or not. I don't always charge them. Depends how forceful they are or how sad they sound in their email. <laughs> okay. uh, I never get offered in the bay. Um, so the, uh, I'm just sharing my, my insight. So the Canterbury team emailed me for a week before and thanking me for agreeing to be their doctor. I was greeted by the coach, the physio, and the captain. I was given some gear uh, to identify myself as the team. And they made it absolutely clear that any decision I made as the doctor would carry. Okay, so that gave me confidence. <coughs> and, 
as it turned out in that particular game, a player was knocked and stumbled around towards me. I didn't have a clue for a moment. And, and he seemed adamant that he should go back on. Now, if that had occurred under Vern Cotter or Joe Smith, uh, they would not have accepted my word. They would have made the decision about concussion 15 years ago. Um, but they never spoke to the doctors. We weren't hooked up. On this occasion, I hesitated because I thought, oh, I wonder what the team will think. And uh, I ran over to the physio and he said, you'll call, doc. And then we took him off. And at, at the half time, they said, uh, doc, uh, you know, we just want to reiterate, uh, we trust you. So that just raises the issue of trust um, within a team. And, and in terms of referees, uh, you need to have the backing of your assistant referees uh, and your team behind you in order to be able to make good decisions. I hesitated because I still wasn't sure about whether I had the backing of the team, if you know what I'm saying, which was ridiculous, really, but it's, it's just the truth. Um, and so that the next time they asked me to, to be the team doc, I had a lot more confidence in being able to make decisions, knowing that they were going to, to back me and not raise a hoo-ha. I mean, you guys get a lot of hoo-ha raised on the lot of decisions you made. I'm pleased to see there are no eye patches tonight. Um, um, but, but, but you raise a good point, and it's a good opportunity to talk about this. This is a shared responsibility. Ultimately, the doc will make the call, but he does rely on the team and his support team and people around him in order for him to make good decisions. You really do need the backing of everybody. Because sometimes it's a 50-50 cause. And, uh, and you just need to stand by your mates when they make the call, one way or another. I went to a, another conference. The conference. They're very expensive, by the way, so don't be impressed. Um, <laughs> and an ex-all black doctor, who I won't name, uh, refused to use the word concussion. Uh, whenever, if I say the gender, you'll know it is. Um, uh, whenever that she called it a head knock, um, and and this gave gave the team an out. If you know what I mean. Um, by saying head knock, they didn't have to commit to the word concussion, and, and, and perhaps at times players were played that were concussed. It raised a, a fallout at the conference. There were a couple of physios who were quite appalled by that, uh, but that's in the past. And, uh, and now there's less pressure on teams because they have more players in the squad and there's better understanding amongst coaches about the toll of concussion on our players and so you get less of that nonsense. Concussion is concussion. It's not a head knock. It has a definition. You can use it. And better to call it, in my opinion, than to not call it. Um, yes? I think in a community rugby context where we don't have a match day doctor, one of my observations over the over recent years with this type of thing is I th it's often a physio or a coach that's on there or a, or a support person that's helping treat someone. And of course, we don't have HIA in the community. It's you're, you're gone. You know, There's no come back in 10 minutes, pass a test. <coughs> And I often feel like they, they're looking to somebody else to make the decision for them. And I think that's when we really need to step up and be strong because I actually feel like when you do make that strong decision, they're actually quite thankful for it because they don't want to make it themselves because, especially when it's a coach or something, they're no more qualified than we are. But, so I think your point there is really good to say err on the side of being strong. And you're, if, you, if, you're, if you err on the side of being a bit harsh, you're never really going to be wrong. Now, you're never going to be that wrong. You're never going to get any criticism from the medical profession. Never. You're just never going to do it. Mostly because I think we, you know, this, this idea that knowledge brings, you know, power is not entirely true. The more I study concussion, the more complex it becomes. And I have to constantly take a lot of information that I'm aware of and try and make it simple for myself. Knowledge is, a complex knowledge is of no value just in my head. Uh, it just is of no value there. It, it's, it's more value if I can simplify it and share it. 
Um, uh, so, so keeping it simple is a good thing when it comes to this, and and I think these sort of evenings are extremely important, so that everybody's on the same page. But this, let me reiterate that you will not get criticised by anybody in the medical or concussion fraternity if you call a rugby not a concussion. You just won't. We're much happier. <coughs> I think there's increasing understanding with that within the, the rugby uh, game, uh, internationally and, and locally. Reps uh, take account of it, the, the way the squads are structured, they're larger, uh, and, and the way we run the game is, is very forgiving for that. I, I guess to understand the, but the purpose behind the, the why we have blue cards in our pockets and why, why we issue them is even on the suspicion, like, like how you're saying, if, if there is that, you know, like you say, that change in state or they're knocked out or we, you know, we do have these telltale signs, perhaps we can go over a, a few of what they might be. Um, yeah, so yeah. we had the Murdoch questions um, that we asked from the sideline, you know, what event you are, who scored last, who won the last game, you know, and what half we in, five them in. But they'll give you an immediate answer as to the cognition of the player. Um, if you look at, um, I don't know how many of you are aware, you, you don't need to know this, I'm just really trying to get an idea of the SCAT 5. Okay, the SCAT 5 is the, the, the neuro-linguistic test we perform within 24 hours. Okay, it's not the IHA even. Yeah, that, that's a quick uh, uh, you know, five minute test. The, the, the SCAT 5 is, is 21 questions with their severity and then the number of memory tests both for words and for numbers, okay? Um, and, and then there's an, a balance assessment and a coordination assessment within the SCAT 5. Now, now when you said, uh, you know, signs of it, there, there are 21 symptoms that can be associated with concussion, okay? Dizziness, lightheadedness, nausea, uh, altered concentration, the, the list is, uh, if for anybody to see SCAT 5, take a look at it, you don't need to study it, but look at the at the, the list of, of of signs and symptoms you can get. We, However, we, actually, we, we had that document, I think three years ago, last time when you were here, yeah, doing the right. same presentation. So I might even just put it, pop it up on the website or yeah, share I, it for those interested. I've got a copy interested. of the SCAT 3. Yep. Uh, I should have a copy of the SCAT 5. So, so those are symptoms. To answer your question about what to look for um, in the middle of a rugby game, uh, I think the altered consciousness, uh, when you ask a question, you don't get a, an answer or you get no answer. The blank stare uh, is a good one. Um, the the obvious ataxia. Ataxia is the you know mm -hmm. you know the one that's they look a bit drunk. Um, and uh, uh, I mean those are the obvious ones. The more obvious ones are are things to do with vomiting and convulsions and uh, but um, uh, th th those are the more obvious ones. Somebody's lying there convulsing or fitting and then that's clearly a sign of a concussion. Um, so there are about five that that would would really, you know, altered consciousness, so they're not all there, you know, stumbling, unable to verbalize. What else, guys? Fitting, you know. Vomiting. You know, it's pretty obvious. There's not like a dozen of them. There's, uh, those are the ones where I believe that a ref would, would become aware of. You know, the more subtle, because when you see that... By the way, just to digress for a minute and just to add further complexity to this discussion, if we took the SCAT 5 test, or the SCAT 3, and asked the general population, it's not concussed patients, 21% of the population walk around every day with symptoms of concussion. <laughs> okay, so 
which means that we no longer, when we're treating concussed patients, we used to talk about the symptom free before they go back to play. We can no longer use that. That's just interesting, isn't it? I mean, we no longer demand that they be 100% simply because of the fact that 21% of the general population have some symptoms most days of the week. So we, we aim for sort of functional recovery. Um, are they able to do what they did before without worsening their symptoms? It's difficult, guys. Uh, and like I said, the more knowledge you'd expect us to be more definite tonight, the more knowledge I've gained <coughs> since our last book. But actually, it's become subtly more complex. However, I will tell you this story about it, and it may lead to more questions. By the way, we'll go to an open question time later just to see what comes off the floor. But, but for instance, of the 500 concussions I've reports I've done for ACC, um, I've only seen three rugby players. Okay, so I'm curious about that. Um, I don't know what that about. I don't know if that is because, because the physios and the clubs are taking care of it, which may be the truth. They're following SCAT 5, you know, going to the physio, etc., etc., um, or, or whether uh, we're missing a whole bunch of concussions. I will say, however, that there's some research on this done in Wellington, where um, a couple of really motivated physios were curious as to why athletes recover in half the time from the rest of the population. So we're not just talking rugby, we're talking any performance athlete, okay, serious, a serious amateur. So then they looked at it more closely and more scientifically as to why that was the case. And the key, or cerebral blood flow, is increased by cardiovascular exercise. Okay. First of all, I'm going to share with you something now, and I need you all to just take a moment and relax before I make the statement, because it's going to come as a shock. Okay, but you've got to be ready for it. Scientifically speaking, women have a greater blood flow to their brains than men. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a scientific fact. Okay? I'm just leaving it there for you to digest until next year. <laughs> But what we can say is that blood flow to the brain helps recovery. Okay? And cardiovascular exercise improves cerebral blood flow. So whereas we used to say complete rest, do nothing for a week, we now say you only do that for 72 hours. And then you start cardiovascular exercise. At 80 percent of your maximum heart rate. That's pretty vigorous, I would say. Hmm. And uh, if you get an exacerbation of symptoms doing that, then you just track back a little bit, but you don't stop the exercise. You track back. You might rest for another day or so, uh, and then restart. You know what I mean? But what we don't do is rest people for as long as we used to, that's not the same as sending them back to rugby. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. It's just an interesting fact that we can get them back to cardiovascular exercise much quicker with better results. And that's come out of the study on athletes compared to non-athletes. So now I tell all my non-athletes to get on, the, on, on a stationary bicycle much sooner than I would have done before. And I tell them, that if their symptoms increase a little bit, not to be afraid, because there's no scientific evidence that when you do cardiovascular exercise, something like a stationary bike, that getting symptoms means that you're continuing the damage or worsening the concussion. So symptoms are not a great guide 
uh, for, for deciding on concussion. A lot of it has to do uh, with pretty much a uh, basic uh, force equals mass times acceleration. You know, if it's a low velocity impact, it's less likely to be a concussion than if it's a high velocity. It's just basic physics. Yes. So what about uh, high velocity impacts uh, where there is no symptoms? So the guy stands up and he's fine. Right. Well, it'll be interesting. Uh, that's a great question um, because it happens every Saturday. You, you watch the games. I mean, doesn't it surprise you sometimes that more guys are concussed? Yes. It surprises me every time I go to a minor 10 game. I'm thinking, well, I'll be busy today and I don't get a call. Um, I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I, the absence of symptoms, you'd have to say, I, I track those players. You see, the problem with, with our game is that the players want to play. You know, this is what they do. And, and so, how do you test the, the truthfulness of, of asking direct questions? You know, do you have a headache? Yes or no? You know? Or a more open question, how do you feel? Can you tell me any, how you're feeling? And how's that different to the way you were feeling before? And then making a decision on that kind of questioning versus just asking them direct questions. You see, even the SCAT 5 is a direct question. Do you have nausea? Yes, no, and if you do, how many? Whereas instead of saying to the player, it's always been true in medicine, opening a, an open-ended question, how different do you feel after the game compared to before the game? And then based on what they tell you, making a decision about whether they've actually been concussed but don't know. Because I had one in a pre-season uh, club game a year ago, I think it was, and there was three players, uh, all three together bang, two of them out cold, but it was three, it was a horrendous knock, and the two of them are gone, there's no doubt about it. But one's got blood out of his head, and the other one's, he's asleep. And, um, and the third one stands up and he tries to tell me he's fine, and I was, there's no way, man, you've, you've gone, you know, you're not, you're not playing on that. And he probably I, wasn't concussed, I don't know, but it was just such a horrendous knock, it's like, I'm not going to let you play. Well, he's got, his symptoms may only come over 24 hours, mm -hmm. and it'd be more interesting if we asked the players 24, because I've travelled with the steamers quite a bit, all over the countryside, and I can tell you that they're different the next morning. A lot of them are high after the game, buzzing, you know, particularly if they've beaten Canterbury. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the next morning they are not feeling good. And I wonder if, you know, if I had that, you know, if I go looking for it. At the moment though, let's not give you too much to think about. I, I think um, I, I think you just have to use uh, you know Common sense. I know that's a word used a lot, but if something looks like it hurt, and and the player isn't quite right, just call it. Uh, you're just not never going to get anybody criticising that. Yeah. So there seems to be a, uh, a lot more awareness around the S and C arena about neck strength. And that's, yes. And it's uh, sort of prevention. Of Thank you for raising that. That's a very good. Another question. I was going to mention that earlier, uh, later in the discussion. Uh, just to, uh, to to add some um, a confidence. So, in um, in concussed patients, 50% in mildly concussed patients, 50% or more are found to have an associated neck injury. Okay. Yeah. So. So. This raises some interesting things. So you don't necessarily have to have a head clash. You can have a whiplash-like injury. So I see some on the TV with my big screen and slow-mo, you know, you, those, those hits where the guy's, okay, does that with his head. I, I would suggest that those are concussions based on the mechanics. So 50%, so, so, so that adds a little uh, kind of string to your bow in terms of refing and observation. If you see a tackle situation 
where, where there's a significant whiplash component, my advice is to take a split second and just observe the player for a second. Uh, thank you, Fab. That's a good, good point. Um, neck injuries are big. Now, to bring it together between brain function and, and, and necks, um, the basis of... So in a straightforward concussion, the person's knocked out briefly. They have just a few seconds of memory loss. They take their time, you know, uh, off, off the paddock. They go to a rehab, which now includes a little more, a quicker return to exercise, but not a quicker return to play. It's still 19 days for a, over 21. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, contact sport at, in the last week with a reassessment before they go on the paddock. If we follow that, um, uh, that's, that's pretty straightforward, okay? It, it gets a, a little more complex with, with uh, players whose symptoms persist uh, beyond that. Um, when you look at, at the... Uh, I'll bring something up um, on the screen. the neck is the most primitive part of your brain. Don't do a lot of thinking that part. It's all instinct. Okay? 
and, and hence the neck connection. And so a lot of symptoms to do with concussion are related to the automatic system of your brain, not the thinking part of your brain. Things like dizziness, unsteadiness, breathing, things that are automatic that you don't think about on a daily basis are affected by a concussion. And we think it's because the midbrain is stopped talking to your thinking brain. But because you experience symptoms in your head, you obviously think, oh, it's, it's this part. You know what I mean? It, I'm, there's something wrong with me, I'm, I'm going to be stupid. You know, um, which is not true. It's, it's not, uh, you know, the damage is obviously recovered, but, but, but the connection or the communication between your thinking brain and your automatic brain has to be re-established. The best way to do that is to basically go back to doing what you're doing to reconnect the, the, the telephone line. Am I making sense? So the man called Barry Willer came up with a concept called autonomic deregulation as an explanation for ongoing symptoms in a mildly concussed patient. It gets more complicated because as Pat mentioned, the neck. I've yet to be able to differentiate between a bad neck injury and a mild concussion in the way they present to me. So before the concussion highlight, which has been going on for the last five or so years, would you say, where we've become really, really interested in the subject, I was making a lot of diagnoses of neck sprain in rugby players. Um, with where's it? And when you go to the literature, uh, you know, as you do, to, to get support for, for what you're thinking, uh, you know, there are a couple of famous sports yeah. medicine physicians who, who, who have listed symptoms of a neck injury. And if you look at the symptoms of a neck injury, they mimic those of a mild concussion. But, but from your point of view, I'm just sharing this information to just fill your heads with cool stuff. Um, including about the sharks, um, I worked on a research vessel, I, I didn't always see sharks, I, I, my job as a junior biologist on a, student, a research vessel was to count hake. Do any of you know what the hake is? It's a, yeah? yeah. <laughs> it's a big fish and I had to cut out the ovaries and weigh them, I had to take the length of the fish, I had to cut out its otolith, and then I had to coordinate these three measures to see if we were overfishing the fish, which we were. It's caught at about 500 meters, and, and, and we did research all the way to the Antarctica on this fish, and we discovered that um, the government's policies were too generous to the Greeks and the Russians, and they were overfishing. But, um, you guys didn't help a lot, did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so it just fascinates me how the brain of the shark, because parts of it look like a human brain. So, um, so back to, to how does this help you? So, so I, I think there's an, I just understand that there's an overlap between necks and and heads, and you don't need to know anything more than know that you've got a 50-50 chance if you see a bad neck injury that they've also got a concussion and when you see a concussion, that they've got a neck injury. Now, that's important in the game. You've seen the new, the new, you know, <coughs> protocol for first aid, you know, where all the physios come and lie down. Uh, Neil Matz and I have to go every so often and get examined on that. We have to write exams. Just the British came up with an exam we have to write. And we have to carry, carry credentialing before we can um, officiate at matches now. You have to have a level two. And, and actually I'm coming up for a refresher course in April uh, to keep my license. I also have a license with, with World Rugby. Um, you have to have a license now. I can show anybody. It's got a cool picture on it. Uh, but it allows me to educate on behalf of World Rugby, first aid in rugby, and um, 
And the cool thing about that is they've just written to me and said I'm eligible for some free gear. As <laughs> 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 a world rugby. So on the side of the field, one or two of you might see me in my world rugby educator kit this winter, <laughs> if you're lucky. Um, so, so let's recap, okay? So we, we, we want you guys to have a low threshold of suspicion. Two, we want you guys to feel confident to make the call and know that at least the docs will back you 100% of the time. Um, I, I cannot think of a situation where you call a concussion, it turns out not to be a concussion, that that's a bad thing. I just, I just can't. And um, to give us some context, we've only had one rescinded blue card. Yeah, that was against 19, yeah. 19 blue cards last year, yeah. one rescinded. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. E exactly. And, uh, and there's a protocol and mm -hmm. there's one they can go through, but I think, I think there's a lot more issues uh, than whether or not we get that wrong. Mm -hmm. And three, to include in your knowledge set this idea that necks and heads kind of go together and have a suspicion when you see a bad neck injury that there may be a concurrent concussion uh, and vice versa. <clears throat> okay, and, and that um, our knowledge, uh, if we just give you knowledge about recognizing concussion, I, I don't believe that's fair. I think knowledge is better simulated in context. You know, why am I looking at his neck? And so my, the purpose of showing you all this medical stuff is so that the decisions you make are contextualized to the medical data. It's not just because we've told you this. It's because there's good, good scientific evidence to support this. So, so HIA is what we do, it's a quick test, we often overrule it, or, or I have, because clearly the guy was ataxic, you know, stumbling all over the paddock, and he ain't going back on, but he passes his HIA, and, and then in other cases, it's clear that at least his symptoms haven't manifested, and, and we have no grounds to exclude him from the game. Well, those times you wonder, we're sending them con concussed patients back on the paddock. But. Uh, so, any, any questions that can, can drive the discussion? Do all the coaches have the same training? I, 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 uh, no. <laughs> so, I'm just sort of going on that point about the fact that we won't have doctors at most of our games and we're relying on coaches. A lot of them to back us up. I do. I do. No, I know, but it's just. It, maybe I, I, this is the way. So yeah, I can answer some of the question in terms of the education of programs. Okay, so, so, the World Rugby has implemented this fair thing where they transport me around the country. My last trip was to Gisborne, uh, Poverty Bay, where where the room is filled with say 14 coaches, uh, coaching everything from. And then I go through, I go through uh, all manner of first aid with them, and they get a certificate. And I have a team with me. It's very, um, it's uh, a, quite a organised, focused group to keep it simple, so that people go away confident. Because it's a, it's a skills-based um, thing they do, not a knowledge-based. So, so we give them a set amount of knowledge, but we test their skills uh, to the player more than we test their knowledge uh, about what to do. Um, so I know that there are, and that uh, forum that I went to provided the opportunity for, for us to all talk about concussion, but not to this level of detail. Okay. So to answer your question, I believe coaches, I should be invited coaches do is like this one to give this presentation, but I've yet to be asked. There, there's an element of the covering rugby smart, not to a great deal of depth that we cover it uh, as referees. So that's, that's my understanding, Pat. Yeah. Correct. Is it something that maybe could be uh, 
strongly suggest it's Fletcher's because we're yeah. really, really pushing this a little bit more this year. It makes sense if they know that it's coming as well. It's not so much. I think anything we're probably pushing more this year. Um, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I don't think who's there, who's there, who's issued a blue card in this room. I, I have. And has there been much pushback from the from the the coaches or at, at the ground at all when you've issued one? No. It, yeah, that's that's okay. The pressure comes afterwards, but that's okay. That comes to uh, comes to us. <laughs> Yeah, but don't worry. Like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. The best thing I've heard tonight, yeah. really, that gives me confidence in making a strong call on a Saturday, is that a doctor still stands up the front and says, we're not sure all the time. Yeah. So if he's not going to be sure all the time, we can't be. But the message is, it's there on the start of being strong. Yeah. Because what's worse, if a coach have a little bit of a crack at you after a game, or someone ending up with a serious, yeah. serious situation that we could have avoided. So, I, and I, I'm not too, like, it's a fair point saying, was well, it good with a, it would be good if all the coaches did the training and had the good idea and all that sort of stuff, but this is the real world, some will, some won't. Yeah. And I've found the most useful thing over the years that I've done is I don't do the, I can't even remember doing the questioning of a player because I don't know the player, so I don't feel like, but what I do do is I'll stand there and I'll listen to the coach asking the <coughs> questions and I'll see if I feel confident that this guy's actually going through a decent process here. And if it's going through a decent process, then I feel like I can step back. If they're not, I'll put them under the pump and say, look, are you really happy with this? And it's amazing how often they're like, yeah, okay, now I'll take them off now. So I just think it's getting clear in your own mind what your your plan's going to be around this stuff. And just having the confidence, like, it, you've got to issue a red card sometimes, and the coach won't agree with that either. He, he's got access to the ball. So we can't get caught up in that. We've just got to work out how we're going to apply it. And I just reckon this is this is some of the most important stuff we can do because you want to be <coughs> refereeing a game at Te Tickle, and there's no doctor there, there's no physio there. You're it. And we've got a big responsibility to get it right as much as we can. And I'm hearing 19 blue cards and one got pinned out. Mm. I reckon that's a great strike rate. Mm -hmm. I reckon doing a great job. Well, the interesting thing is, of course, I get to see the patients after they leave rugby. Okay, so, so I, I did a, a, a paper some years ago about this very subject on injuries. And uh, so in the early days of the steamers, I, I was interested in injury um, recording in order to see if it influences our coaching methods. And so, so I went looking in the literature and I found an Irish doctor who'd come up with a, a way of recording rugby injuries that could be, if you used it, then we could re compare rugby injuries throughout the world. To, to see if we were different or ahead or less than, say, the rugby players in Ireland. Okay? And then I applied it to the steamers in 2003. I was trying to convince Bernard Cotter the value of having a doctor on his team because he didn't want a doctor. Um, he called me no, <laughs> which is very disrespectful because my name's Sean. Um, but I thought if I did a study, um, I would show him the value of, 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 of recording uh, things. And, and so you, you don't know how big a problem you have or don't have until you start looking for it and recording it. So, so the idea is the more I can educate you, the more you'll know, the more you'll recognize. And, and maybe actually, don't be afraid if that means next year, I come or the year after, whenever I do another talk for you guys, uh, the number of blue cars goes up. It has to go up with increased knowledge. The game, unless we do something fundamentally different with the rules, this is a contact sport. You know, you know, you, you're going to get hurt, and if you know, I still think they're trying too hard. I mean, I mean, it's a contact sport, so you don't want to play contact sport. Then, but we can do something about avoiding obvious injury. You know, we're not we're, we're not boxing out there. On, you know, where the sole aim is to hurt your opponent. You know, we want to play you know good footy uh, and and try and get home at night. So, 
So the motivation is different. So don't be surprised if you find, because when we recorded, just of interest, uh, that season, um, the steamers had 90 injuries. Um, uh, there were only two player games lost because we started to get a trend and, and we also started to initiate a specific uh, rehabs as opposed to general rehab. Um, and um, the most, most injuries were in the loose forwards, um, which stands to reason because they did the most tackles. And, and what was really interesting, or more interesting than anything, wasn't so much this clever discovery, was that our data compared to the same level of team uh, in Scotland. So, so, so we were doing you know, the same, and that was, that was comforting in some ways. We weren't worse off, or worse off it seems if the game generates this kind of injury. So the same could be said about concussions. Um, I think this is a worldwide issue. I, I don't think we, uh, I think we're ahead of the game personally because of the way uh, Kiwis communicate. We, we're very good at it. Uh, even if it's, it's on the sideline, one-on-one, -on -one, we share information really well. Because there's not that same hierarchical uh, kind of thing as you get overseas. Any more questions or issues raised? I think that point is valid, uh, and it's an exact truth. Uh, we are never 100% sure. There isn't a test for concussion. There's a whole bunch of tests we can do to help us with our decision making, but we don't have a nice test. There is one coming, I believe. I believe the Americans once again, and they, the problem with the Americans, they come up with really brilliant ideas, and then they charge too much. <laughs> <laughs> there is going to be a test you're going to be able to do to clarify whether the person's been concussed, which is of no value to you on the pad. I'm just sharing with you what's coming. You know, the next day you'll have a blood test or some sort of test, and we will say, yes, yes, you are concussed. That's coming. Anything else, guys? Any questions? Yeah. Cool. Um, Sean, look, thank you so much for, for coming to see us again tonight. Uh, particularly, it's, just, it's amazing that it's been three years already since, uh, since the last time you were here and that we, we first had training on this. Um, I know that certainly myself, I have a few bit more knowledge for going out there and feel a bit more confident now if I do have to issue a blue card. Uh, so I think I've said on behalf of everyone here. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>